Good morning. What a blessing it is to be here this morning as we've gathered together as God's children, whether online or in person, to glorify and uplift His holy and wonderful name. What a blessing it is to be here this morning as we've gathered together as God's family, as God's children, as brothers and sisters in Christ, to be able to remind ourselves that in the midst of all that's going on, in the midst of everything, when it feels like foundations are collapsing, uh, the world's uh, foundations, we remind ourselves just like the way we had in the song, like the way we sang in the song, that we have a cornerstone, uh, the chief cornerstone, Jesus Christ. What a blessing it is to be here this morning to remind ourselves of that. I said good morning this, uh, to y'all this morning. If I saw you as you came in, it was hard for me to see some of y'all because my glasses kept fogging up. So if I didn't say hello, it wasn't because I was, if I looked like I was sitting up here mean mugging everybody, that wasn't the case. <laughs> I, just, I was just like really confused, <laughs> didn't know who was who. Uh, but you know, I used that phrase this morning, good morning. Uh, I had a good cup of coffee uh, this morning, a real good cup of coffee. Um, Anthony Rizzo is a good baseball player, good first baseman, but he also seems like, by the world standards, a good person. Uh, we use that phrase a lot, right? Good. We use it in so many different ways. We use it to describe uh, things that we see as a certain quality, right? Uh, we see at a high level of quality. Uh, but what is that phrase? What is the word good? What does it mean to be good? What does goodness mean biblically? Uh, we, uh, the passage that was read to us this morning is taken from Galatians chapter 5, and verse 22 through 23. As we've broken down the fruit of the Spirit, as we've looked at what it means, because remember, in order to bear the fruit of the Spirit, what does that imply that you and I must be doing? We must be walking in the Spirit, right? And just like the way last week we discussed it, we said walking in the Spirit means walking in line and in step with the Spirit-inspired Word of God. So as we are striving to walk in the Spirit, walk in the Word of God, uh, when we do that, we bear attributes. We bear these things, these marks that show that we truly are God's people. We looked at love. We've looked at joy. We looked at peace. We looked at patience. Last week we looked at kindness. Today we're going to be looking at goodness. What does it mean to display goodness? Well, again, these are fruits of the Spirit, right? These are fruit of the Spirit, which means who bears those attributes? Well, the Spirit of God. God, that is. So when we look at this, we want to first take note that goodness is a fruit that God bears. Uh, you remember in Genesis chapter 50, towards the end of that book, uh, we find in the story of the patriarchs, we go to Joseph, right? And Joseph has just revealed to his brothers that he was, remember, they, they came to Egypt, uh, they thought he was this, you know, he was in a position of power, but they couldn't recognize him, because remember, long before that, they sold him into slavery, right? Uh, hoping that he would die. But you know what Joseph said? He said, you meant this for evil. There in Genesis chapter 15, and verse 20, he says, you meant this for evil, but God used it for good. He's a goodness came out of this because because of what happened, God in his providential care, being good God, he uses to preserve us as a family. You think about one of the individuals that was in that family, one of the individuals that sold Joseph into slavery, Judah. And God, by preserving, remember, there was a famine that hit the land. And if it were not for Joseph being in that position of power... Judah, along with his brothers and his father, would have starved, and God providentially, in his goodness, preserved Judah. You're probably wondering why I keep referencing Judah. Well, who is Judah? Who came from Judah? Oh, David. Who came from David? Jesus Christ. So God, in his goodness, Joseph, even as far back as the Genesis story, knew there's something that's going to come from this, and God meant for us good. Uh, David in Psalm 136 and verse 1 says, We give thanks to the Lord for He is good, for His steadfast love endures forever. David will also say in Psalm 119 and verse 68, he says, You are good. He's talking to God. That entire psalm is glorifying God for His Word, glorifying God for the truth that we find in the Word, the thing that helps us to keep in line with His Spirit, the very essence of God. In Psalm 119, verse 36, David says, you are good. You do good. Teach me your ways. Teach me your statutes. I want to learn what goodness looks like because I know it comes from you. In Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse 4, Moses describes God as being upright. It's the Hebrew word that also means good. Paul in Romans chapter 7 and verse 18 and 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 8 says that the teachings of God, the law of God, is good. 
As a matter of fact, you remember Mark chapter 10 and in verse 18. In Mark chapter 10 and in verse 18, there was a, a, a rich young ruler who approached Jesus, right? You remember that? And he asks a question. He says, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, why do you call me good? For the only one who is good is God. And in that phrase, good, what he's talking about there is the complete description of good. The, the, Jesus is saying, look, if you're going to call me good, then you also better be calling me God. If you're going to be calling me complete goodness, if you're going to say I'm the very definition of what good looks like, well, that's who God is. So then who do you say that I am? Good teacher. Because only God perfectly bears. Remember how last week we said when it came to kindness that you and I have to learn kindness. God doesn't have to learn it. Remember how last week we also said God, or remember how, how previous weeks we said all those attributes God perfectly embodies, you and I, we struggle with them. Uh, when it comes to goodness, it's the same thing. God doesn't have to learn goodness. He is goodness. He's the perfect example of what goodness is all about. As a matter of fact, everything that he provides for us, James in James 1.17 says, Every good and every perfect gift comes down from above and comes from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of, uh, of turning. See, the Bible clearly states that the goodness of God is unquestionable. It's foundational. Uh, here's the thing. If we are in Christ, we have to understand that it is absolutely foundational to our belief. It's foundational to our life. It's foundational to Christianity to say God is good. Amen? Amen. Because Christianity wouldn't exist without His goodness. God is good all the time, all the time. God is good. At my home congregation, we say that a lot. And that's true. All the time, God is good. And that's the thing. When we think about His goodness and how it's foundational, it's foundational despite, a lot of times, like the book of Job, for example, the book of Job questions various different things. It doesn't necessarily question why do we suffer, as many people try to search in that book as to why we suffer, but rather it takes God's wisdom and it compares it with man's wisdom because a lot of times things that happen in this life cause, us, uh, cause our vision to be skewed, amen? Things that happen in this life sometimes knock our vision uh, in, in, a, in a different direction. And the purpose of the book of Job was to correct man's vision of who God really was and who they were in comparison to him, one of the things that kept coming up by some of his friends were, well, we know God is good, but why do these things happen? I want us to understand something. No matter the circumstances in this life, no matter the season of life, no matter what may be going on in this world, what may be going on in our individual life, it does not change the fact that God is good. That's foundational. As a matter of fact, uh, we look at that same attribute exhibited by the Son of God himself, right? Jesus Christ. In Acts chapter 10 and verse 38, Peter is preaching to Cornelius. And you know what he says? He, he, said, he says, We're, he's, I'm coming to teach to you the things that Jesus did, the good things that Jesus did, our Savior, as he helped those who were, who were broken and afflicted by Satan. In Acts chapter 10 and verse 38, he says, Jesus went about doing good. It's not that Jesus, like we talked about last week, right? Jesus was kind. But it wasn't just kind, he was good in that kindness, and he was kind in his goodness. He did the right things. For example, in the wilderness, you remember he's being tempted by Satan. Jesus did the right thing. He overcame. In the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, when, when, he, when he even said, if there's any other way that this can go down, Father, if there's any other way that some, this could take place, if there's anything else, let this cup pass from me. But then he says, but not my will. Your will be done. That was goodness. When they arrested him, remember they called, they called out and said, are you Jesus? He doesn't deny it. He could have pointed at Peter and said, oh, there's Jesus right there. That would have been messed up. That would have completely changed the whole story. But he doesn't do that. He doesn't do that. You want to know why? Because he's good. And why am I saying all those things? Because his immense eternal goodness, the uh, reason why he went through all those things, the reason why he endured. Can you imagine living 33 plus, uh, and a half years, so to speak? 33 years, 30, 33 years. Some scholars debate as to, as to the length of his age. But could you imagine living that long and living a sinless life? I'm 30 years old. I can't even imagine that. He did that so he can be the perfect sacrifice. That is good. Amen? That's hope. 
And when we look at the goodness of God, the goodness of God saturates the scriptures. And if you're a Christian, again, you are living proof of his goodness. We have salvation because of his goodness. We have hope because he is good. You and I can know that in the midst of the dark times in this life and in this world, we know that we can endure. We know that we can overcome. We know all those things work together for good because he's good. Romans 8 and verse 28. God is good. Sometimes it's hard to say, right? But it's true. Why do I say it's hard to say? Not because God has ever shown us a time where, he may, where that may be questionable, but just as I said earlier, there are times that it's easy to question the goodness of God. But you know what Paul says? He says we have to take note of the goodness of God. We have to acknowledge it. We have to come to understand it. We have to come to the terms that we have to see how God has been good. And here's the thing, whether you and I choose to acknowledge it or not, again, like we said earlier, does not change the fact that he is immensely good. The fact that he is the perfect embodiment of good. The fact that good would not exist without him. He is good. He is our God. And therefore, when we say it's a fruit of the Spirit, we're saying that this is that which God bears Himself. That this is an attribute that God did, that God has had long before the foundation of the world. An attribute that makes God who He is. He is God. He is good. I encourage you, uh, we're not going to take all the time in this sermon to do this, but I encourage you to do a study on the goodness of God. To see the times that his goodness was declared by even those who were going through terrible things in their life. The book of Lamentations. Take the book of Lamentations, for example. Whether, it was the, uh, whether the writer was Jeremiah, uh, traditionally many people believe it was Jeremiah. Whoever the writer was of the book of Lamentations, uh, the, the writer there, in that book, he says, look, here is how, well, the reason why Jerusalem was destroyed, the reason why it was destroyed was because of Israel's wickedness and turning away from God's goodness. And yet in the midst of that, he says, look, Israel was destroyed. We were broken down as a people. God allowed for Babylon to come and absolutely overthrow us. And yet we're still here. And yet we're still alive. And yet, the family line of Jesus is still preserved. As a matter of fact, when you read the end of 2 Kings, you find King uh, Jehoiachin, or, 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 or depending, on, depending, on, on which, uh, depending on which translation you're looking at, you find that particular king who was in the seed line of Jesus. He could have been killed. Instead, we find that he was taken out of his prison cell, and he ate at the seat of the king of, of Babylon for the rest of his life. God preserved, in the midst of all that, the family of of Jesus. Why? To bring salvation. And that's the reason why the writer of Lamentations can say in Lamentations chapter th uh, 2, verse 22 through th 23, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. He, they are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope. Therefore, I will trust in him because he is good. Secondly, if goodness is a fruit that God bears, again, uh, we note that these are attributes of which God bears himself. And yet Paul says, these are also attributes you must bear. Uh, these are also attributes that you as a child of God, you as a son of God, as a daughter of God, which means that you bear the imprint of God in your life, i.e. the Holy Spirit. Because you bear his spirit in your life through the word, you must then do what? You must demonstrate goodness. Now again, just like we said earlier, goodness is an attribute that God doesn't have to learn, right? But it's one that I need to. When we look at what we're going to talk about next, as we look at goodness, goodness is a fruit we must bear. Goodness in Galatians chapter 5 means uprightness of heart and life. In other words, that you are good in and you are good outwardly. So how can we strive for goodness? How can we bear the fruit that embodies God, that the Savior, the Spirit who dwells within us and in whom we dwell? This is how Jesus explains it. If you have your Bibles, I want to look at Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6, and we're going to go ahead and look at verse 43 through verse 45. Luke chapter 6 and verse 43 through verse 45. 
And Jesus uh, speaks here in Luke chapter 6, verse 43 through 45. He just gets done talking about what it means to judge others, to not judge others unrighteously. But then he talks about bearing fruit. He says there are attributes that are going to show you, or rather people are going to show you attributes about themselves, because here's the reason why. He says in verse 43, for no good tree bears what? He says no good tree bears bad fruit. Nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit. For each tree is known by its own fruit. For figs are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor are grapes picked from a bramble bush. The good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good, and the evil person out of the evil treasure produces evil. You notice how he says evil treasure, good treasure. You know what that means? The things in which you harbor so closely in your life. If you harbor the treasures of goodness, what are you then going to bear? If those are things that you allow for yourself to keep hidden in your heart, so that way it can pour forth in your life, you're going to bear goodness. He says, but the one who hears and does not do them, that is, does not do good. Or excuse me, excuse me, reading a different verse. He says, the good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good, and the evil person out of his evil treasure produces evil, for out of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaks. So as a man thinks in his heart, that is what? That's who he is. The word think means to meditate. So as a man ha has meditated, as a person has meditated in their heart, as they've harbored in their heart, as they kept in their heart, how can a young man keep his heart secure? Psalm 119, young person, a young woman, how can anyone keep their way secure? Psalm 119 tells us, by guarding his heart according to the word. So if goodness is something that comes from having good treasure in your heart, how do I get good treasure in my heart? How do I secure it so that my steps match what's going on in here? It's the word, walking in the spirit, just like the way we talked about last week. Uh, Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8. I want us to go ahead and turn there. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8. I want us to read that together to see what Paul here challenges the Philippians to do. Paul is in the middle of prison. Uh, he's, he's in prison. He's in prison in Rome. Uh, this is one of those letters that he wrote from prison. And Paul, writing this letter, constantly talks about the concept of joy, which we talked about several weeks ago. Uh, but what he, what, one of the things that he challenges, he says, look, if you want to have this mindset of joy, here's what you need to do. And likewise... The same thing goes for goodness. He says in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8, he says here, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think, that word think means to meditate. Think about, meditate on these things. So how, by what source do we meditate on? Psalm 1 tells us. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of the sinner, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is on the law of the Lord, and on his word he meditates day and night. You want to learn goodness, you can't learn it apart from the word of God. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16 and 17, Paul himself even says there, he says, For all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Remember what we said last week, what inspiration of God means? It means it's God breathed. That word pneuma, breathe, means that it is the essence, it is the spirit of God. Again, walking in the spirit means what? Walking in the word. All scripture is breathed out by God's spirit and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that a man of God may be complete. Thoroughly furnish to do what? Good works. He's got the word of God in his life so he and she can do good. Jesus would say in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 16, let your light so shine before men. So what? So they could see how awesome you are. He says, no, so they could see your good works, but why? So that way they can say, man, that Paul Delgado, he is awesome. Man, that, that Mark Varney, he is awesome. Mark Varney is awesome. But is it for that purpose? No, he says, so that way they may glorify God. Because when they see you do what biblically... Here's the thing, again, we said, you remember how earlier I said, you know, Anthony Rizzo is a good player, but he also seems like a good person by human standards. Here's the thing, it's impossible for us to be... We were created by God, amen? amen. It's impossible to be the things of God if we don't go back to His Word. It's impossible. We can be good by the world's standards, but is that the same as God's standards always? Absolutely not. 
And so if I want to be good by the definition of the person who created me, remember, you were created with a purpose, and that purpose was to live, as Solomon says in Ecclesiastes, to live for him. So because of that, if I'm going to bear goodness, it can't be apart from God, and it can't be apart from his word. It can't be apart from the Spirit. Remember the, uh, the parable of the, uh, the Good Samaritan. The Good Samaritan, Luke chapter 10. See, the idea of goodness, a lot of the people in the day of Jesus, they thought goodness meant this. They thought goodness meant not doing bad things. In other words, you don't, you don't necessarily do bad things. Like remember, you have a Levite, you have a priest who walked by this man who's broken on the side of the road, right? You have this man who was robbed, he was beaten, and these two guys, you know what they thought to themselves as they walked by him? Well, at least we weren't the ones who did it, because that's bad. So therefore, because we weren't the ones who did bad, then that must mean we're doing good. And they walked on their way. The Good Samaritan saw the exact same thing they saw. And he wasn't the cause of the problem, right? But he sought to do good to him. That's why he's called the Good Samaritan. Because he didn't just say, well, I'm not doing bad things. He was seeking to do good things. God does that. God has sought to do good for humanity since the beginning, right? God has sought to do good. God has done good. Not sought, like as if, he, as, if, as if it's something that sometimes is attainable. No, God has always done good to humanity since the beginning. That's the thing about goodness. When we think about goodness, the goodness isn't just the avoidance of bad, but it seeks to do good. Goodness sees and treats people the way we should see them. Uh, uh, David says in Psalm 139, verse 14, he describes himself, and he describes humanity. He says, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. You remember in Genesis chapter 1, and verse 31, after God created man, what did he call them? It's a very good. That's how God sees each other. That's how God sees us. How do we see people how are we living are we living according to that, that the way god saw very good and do we strive to see people the same way do we strive to see people as fearfully and wonderfully made and to help them live according to the purpose that god has designed for them one of my favorite passages is in james 3 and verse 13 let's go ahead and turn there if you will i want to read that passage together james chapter 3 and in verse 13 and this is what he says here, because this is something I have to remind myself. Uh, he talks about wisdom. He says, seeking the wisdom from above. But in James 3 and verse 13, he says, Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works. Let him show his goodness in meekness of wisdom. See, goodness isn't just something that we do just to do it. It's something that comes from the wisdom that's above. It's something that comes, it builds internally. You can, there are people who may seem, there are people, I mean, you find out about celebrities, people that on the surface seem like they were, we would say, good people. And that's why, man, don't dig too deep into a lot of people. You find out things, you get really disappointed. Uh, there are people who, who find out things about, about celebrities that you're like, what happened? You put on a good masquerade, but that doesn't mean you were good. The Pharisees put on a good mask, didn't they? But it doesn't mean who they really were. Uh, see, goodness, like God, isn't good just because it's virtuous. It isn't just good because, well, you know, we do the right thing because that, it is the right thing to do. Again, uh, David even says, how could I, or excuse me, uh, Joseph, you remember when Potiphar's wife, when Potiphar's wife, when she, when she was trying to seduce him, remember he said, how could I commit this sin against God? But he also, in that same sentence, thought about Potiphar as well. It wasn't just good because he didn't want to hurt God, which is important. That's where it needs to begin. But he also recognized, I don't want to break the relationship with my fellow humans, with human beings. Because God created us both. How could I break that with them? See, goodness isn't good just because it's virtuous, but goodness is good because of the benefits. It provides others as well. I want us to understand something. Goodness doesn't approach or entertain sin. Goodness does the right thing, and it challenges other people to do the same, even if the conversation is uncomfortable. That's the other thing. It is good to help people recognize when they need to be doing good. But just like the way we talked last week, that needs to be saturated in kindness, right? We don't want to just, because it's good to correct people, but we've got to be kind in how we do it. Those things got to go together. All these fruit of the Spirit, they've all got to go together. Uh, that's the reason why, you know, oftentimes you hear fruits of the Spirit, right? 
Uh, but the word there is singular. In other words, these are all aspects that make that fruit of God what it is. Uh, these aren't just some different attributes that you can bear sometimes and, and other ones, you know, maybe another time and, you know, use this one more. No, these are all attributes that have to coincide together because when does God say, you know what, I don't think I'm going to be good today. He doesn't. And if God bears those things, then it's our goal to strive to do the same thing. That's why it's called godliness. To strive to be like God. Goodness is decent, it's honest, it's moral, it's, honor, it's honorable, it's virtuous, and full of integrity. Good people don't just do the right thing, they make things right. We help, remember, uh, Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 through the end of that section, he says there, he says that we are a part because God reconciled us, Christ reconciled us back to God, right? You and I are a part of a ministry of reconciliation. It is our responsibility to help others. You know what the good thing, you know what the best thing you can do in somebody's life is? Think of all the, the good things the world or rather, the way the world defines goodness. Think of all those things, and we think that if we settle just for those things, that that's fine. The greatest thing, the good thing, the truly good thing you can do for somebody in their life is teach them about Christ. It's to love them like Jesus. It's to show them the way. There's a lot of people who are seeking the good for humanity and our society, but without Jesus Christ, then is it good? If Christ isn't the solution... If Christ isn't the plan, if Christ isn't, isn't the, the forerunner of it, and if Christ isn't the foundation of it, then are those things good in and of themselves? Christ has to be the equation of it. So if we're teaching people, even like when I'm studying with somebody, uh, you know, there, there are times I, I've sat in studies, I've engaged in studies where I have to refocus, where I want to deal with everything else in their life, and I forget, you know what, the good thing I need to do right now is talk about Jesus. Because Jesus is the best, the greatest thing. Think about this for a second. God is good, right? God is immensely good. That goes without saying. We talked about that earlier. God is good, and that good God had this good plan that formulated the good news, right? Isn't that what, isn't that what, what gospel means? Evangelion, good news? So that you and I could live a good life so that someday we can hear, as Jesus says in Matthew chapter 25 and verse 23, well done, good and faithful servant. Christianity is a life that the foundation of it is goodness and the end result, eternity, is good. I want to hear that someday. Well done, good and faithful servant. Do you want to hear the same thing? You've got to obey the gospel. You've got to be, to be a part of that goodness of God. God has, in His goodness, created this plan, this good news, the gospel, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If you want that goodness, you've got to be in goodness itself, in the good news, the greatest news, the news of Jesus Christ, death, burial, resurrection, and because of that, man has salvation from sin. And therefore, when we follow that, when we are baptized and we rise in news of life, we, we live that lifestyle of the gospel, as Paul uh, would point out in Romans chapter 6, verse 3 through 4, we strive to live a life that is saturated in goodness. Because I want to hear, and I know you want to hear someday. And we want others in our lives, not just me. I don't, I don't, I don't want to, I'm not going to hear, well done, good and faithful servant, if I'm not trying to help other people hear the same thing, right? Because that's what goodness is. Goodness isn't just looking out for me. It's looking out for everyone before me. That's good. Goodness, love, those attributes of God, it means that God has a mind full of something. He shows goodness to his creation. He shows goodness to us. That means God has a mind full of us. And likewise, he has called us to have a mind full of him and a mind full of others. Isn't that what Jesus said is the greatest commandment? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And second to this, love your neighbor as yourself. That's goodness. Are we striving for that? As God's people, are we striving to be known as good people? People that are living and embodying the fruit of of the Spirit. If you're here this morning or if you're online, it is my encouragement to you that you strive and seek after goodness. Because God is good and He's given you a life that is meant to be good. 
Christianity is a good life. It's not the easiest life. It's not, it's not a life. But compared to sin, actually, Jesus says it's way easier than trying to bear sin alone. He says way better. It's the best life to live. It is the only life that you can say is truly good. If you want that this morning, we encourage you to make that be known as we stand and we sing, or excuse me, as we sing this next song.